Hello and welcome to Wellness Live. My name is Dr. Olivia Moses and we are so excited to have you join us here today. If you are live, don't forget that you can text us um, or sorry, comment in the comment section if you're watching us on YouTube or on our website and you can ask direct questions right to our expert. Well, this is Wellness Live and it is brought to you by the Living Whole Program here at Loma Linda University Health. And we are very excited to have our special guest today. But before I do that, let me introduce the topic a bit. We have been, if you're watching us live, coming out and going back in and coming out and going back in when it comes to the COVID-19 virus. It has changed our world quite a bit. And some of us have felt isolated. Some of us have self-isolated just because we were trying to stay safe. And this idea of community starts to become a big issue in many of our lives. So do we need community? How do we need it? Why do we need it? And is it important? Mm -hmm. We have a fantastic speaker here to us. It is our wonderful Dean of our School of Religion here at Loma Linda University. His name is Le Dr. Leo Ranzelin, and he is here to talk about community. So without further ado, thank you, Dr. Ranzelin, for being here with us today. Okay. Let me... Uh, okay, thank you, Dr. Moses. Uh, can you see my my screen? Is it there? Yes, we can see your screen, but it is not on presentation mode. Okay. I wonder if Eric could fix that. Yeah, the six button on the bottom there, where it notes comments. Yep. There we go. How's that? Perfect. Great. Thanks again, uh, Dr. Moses. I am just delighted to be with you here this afternoon on the Wellness Live program. So as you beautifully said uh, in the introduction, we're going to talk about community. And you notice my title here. It says that no man is an island, our need of community. Now, this phrase, no man is an island, actually comes from John Donne, this Anglican priest who wrote this famous poem way back in the 1600s, in which he tried to make the case that human beings are interconnected and interdependent. We are social creatures in need of kinship and of community. And so I wanna make the case of John Donne's poem, indeed, that none of us is an island. So here we go. Let's start off with a problem. Again, as Dr. Moses just said, we need to underscore the impact of the pandemic on our society. It's been broad and very challenging. No aspect of our normal functioning has been spared in our society. We've been quarantined. We've had to socially distance from one another. We've had to mask. And what that has done, as many of us know, it has elevated profound levels of loneliness and social isolation, which in turn have produced physical and mental health issues. Secondly, we need to also talk about the impact of our digital world that we're oftentimes unaware of. Our digital world is really in dramatic ways changing our relationship, not just with nature, but also with our human relationships. We are deeply impacted by technology and we spend way too much time with technology and less time noticing and interacting with this material touchable world. And social media in particular trains us to notice that which is large, loud, urgent, trending, and distant. And therefore, we tend to miss the small, quiet importance of our proximate and limited and embodied lives. I just recently had an experience of this when I went to a mall and was in the food court there. And there was this family of four or five people, none of them talking to each other. Each and every one of them was looking at their cell phone. In addition to the pandemic, in addition to the impact of our digital world, I think we need to talk about this kind of rugged individualism that exists here in the West, in our North American culture. Because this emphasis on the individual, on the whole, tends to weaken community. It undermines our enduring bonds and relationships. It disconnects us from structures and networks of meaning, and it deprives us of our communities of meaning and of purpose. 
So there's more that I could say barriers to uh, community, but I think these three in particular, the pandemic, our digital world, and our inclination towards individualism all create a profound sense of loneliness and of social isolation on the part of many people. And so what's the remedy? What is the antidote? The remedy is we all are social creatures in need of kinship and desperately in need of community. And so what I wanna do uh, this afternoon briefly is to sketch before you two pictures of a united and sharing community that we find in the book that we call Acts of the Apostles. The first one is in Acts chapter two, and the second one is in Acts chapter four. The first one in Acts chapter two truly underscores how united that early Christian community truly was. So here we go. Here's the first picture of the early Christian community. On a regular basis, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayers. And the text says that awe came upon every soul. These practices that they were engaged in generated this profound sense of awe and wonder. Everyone who believed were together, and they had all things in common. And we'll talk more about that in the second picture. On a daily basis, they gathered together in the temple precincts, and they also, on a regular basis, broke bread in their homes. And when they received food, the text says that they received it with a glad and generous heart, thanking and praising God, and they had favor with all the people that were there in the city of Jerusalem. And this witness of their unity, empowered by the Spirit, led to many people wanting to join this community. And so the Lord, on a regular basis, added to their number those who were being saved. So let's briefly go through this passage and highlight some important aspects. First, a spirit-filled united community engages on a regular basis in learning and education. The text says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And what this was more than likely was the 12 apostles shared with their uh, early believers their experience uh, with Jesus, his preaching, his teaching, and healing ministry. And so that experience that they had with them, along with their seeking to teach them and how this gets actualized and realized anew now within the church, was what took place early on, it was a community committed to learning and studying the word of God. Secondly, as you can see here with this picture, the early Christian community was a loving and caring community. The word that's used here is koinonia. And this word expresses the believer's shared experience that they had with God and with each other. The fellowship include giving and receiving of material possessions. And this involved a mutual sharing of food, of clothing, of living space, and money. As we're going to see here shortly, they were deeply interested in making sure that there was not a single needy person among them. And so they expressed their love in a very visible and concrete way by sharing their material possessions. Thirdly, they were a happy and joyful community. They enjoyed hanging out with each other. The text says they devoted themselves to breaking of bread. And this more than likely meant that there was a, a formal and informal aspect to this. The formal aspect was that they probably celebrated the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, this sacrament, this ordinance that the Lord asked them to engage in. But they also uh, engaged in, in an informal way. Uh, having meals on a regular basis with one another in their house churches. And so um, this third practice of the early church underscores how happy and joyful they were. And that's, again, illustrated by the fact that when they received the food, they received it with a glad and generous heart. And then the fourth practice is that the community on a regular basis engaged in prayer. One could say that prayer was the very part of the very fabric of their lives and the vitality of 
the church really could be measured by the reality of their prayers. So here are the early Christian communities practices that underscored how united they were. On a regular basis, they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. Now I could give lots of illustrations uh, of this practice, um, but one that I wanna share with you briefly this afternoon comes from Father Greg Boyle. He is just an incredible minister, priest, and pastor. He actually was here at Loma Linda some two, three years ago, sharing his ministry that takes place there in Los Angeles. It's actually in a barrio of Los Angeles called Boyle Heights. He has a parish there called the Dolores Mission. And he also has founded this industry called Homeboy Industries. And this ministry of Father Boyle is the largest re-entry, rehabilitation, gang intervention program, and I'm not overstating things, in the world. It's just unbelievable um, what he does there in Los Angeles. He's written three books. His most famous one is this one called Tattoos on the Heart. I highly recommend reading all three, but especially the first one, Tattoos on the Heart. But in all these books, what he does is that he shows that these young people, more often than not part of gangs, are longing for kinship and community that's authentic. And the kind of kinship and community that they find in their gangs is prone to violence, prone to crime, which takes so many of them into prison. And he underscores this point to them that, guys, this is not what real community is about. And so he invites them to his church, to his parish, and he seeks to provide them employment so that they can experience authentic community. He's got a couple of quotes here that I wanna share with you. He says that we seek to create loving communities of kinship precisely to counteract mounting lovelessness, racism, and I would add here loneliness, isolation, and the cultural disparagement that keeps us apart. Then he says that the measure of our compassion lies not in the service of those on the margins. This is quite a statement because he's saying, yes, many of us are engaged in service and ministry with others, and that's all good. But if you really want to see a compassionate, loving expression of the grace of God, it involves our willingness to go to the margins and to be in kinship and in fellowship with those who are on the margins, the social outcasts, the marginalized the disenfranchised, the poor, enter into kinship with them. That is what true, authentic community and kinship is all about. And again, as I say, in all three of those books, he illustrates that in a powerful way. So I think this is a good place to, to stop and reflect and engage on some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ranzelin. It is powerful, powerful things you're talking about today. I love this idea of community and so interesting. Even if you go into social media, if you go, if you watch TV or movies or wherever, you see this idea of friendship and family. That is what many of these stories are kind of surrounding, you yeah. know, posting pictures with friends, posting pictures with community. But um, what you said really hit home in the fact that there are ways that you can build it. And I love that it's around food because that's one of my favorite things to do. So um, <laughs> yeah. we do have some questions coming up. So the question is, how can I improve the quality of my existing relationships and community? Mm. Um, I'm going to actually get to that. I'm going to propose here because I'm going to get to uh, Dan Buettner's book, The Blue Zones, in which he talks about holistic living. And that's in the second part of my uh, presentation. But he uh, has found through his research and others as well, that if you're part of a religious community and Buettner found that it doesn't really matter if it's Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, or, or what have you. But if you're part of a religious community and you attend on a regular basis, there's just something about that experience that tends to, to build wholeness, well-being, purpose, 
meaning and hope in one's life. And it's just crucial uh, to have these kinds of experience if you really want to experience true community and wholeness in its fullest sense. Great. So I would encourage these people to consider participating in a religious community. Yeah. Um, that actually goes into this next question. I understand community is important. How do I get involved in one if mm. I don't feel like I have one now? Ah, that's very good. I would uh, encourage you to reflect on, on your religious upbringing, whether it's Protestant or Catholic, and just think again to uh, go back to that church that your mom and dad took you to when you were young, either a Sunday school or Sabbath school. Think of joining the church again and finding uh, ways to be concretely involved in the life of the church in a visible way. Again, what comes through in these two pictures of the early church is that they were very active. You know, they just weren't sitting in the church or in their house churches. They were involved in, in activities and specific practices. And so here at the Loma Linda Church, University Church, as many of us know, we have all kinds of opportunities. You Reach is one of those. Uh, they do just some tremendous work. Uh, here at the university level, uh, CAPS is just incredible. And also um, SIMS, right? These are opportunities for uh, all of us to be involved that involved, that allow us to, to practice and live out our faith. So get involved. Sure. Um, this is actually a good question that came through. Are there any cautions around support systems or communities? Mm, that's that's a really good question because you want to make sure that the religious community that you join is one in which, you know, from a, speaking from the standpoint of the, the Christian faith, that it's an authentic biblical expression of the faith. Uh, oftentimes you have these religious communities that are, I would say, distortions of the faith. And I think that it's not just the Christian faith that has those problems. I would say probably the Jewish faith, Hindus, Muslims, um, and Buddhists as well have the same problem. So do your research to make sure that the religious community that you're joining is, what's the right word here? Authentic, holistic, and and real and and coheres with the religious traditions of your scriptures. And we'll have one more question um, for this half. What does a healthy? Oh, sorry. Are there benefit? Are the benefits the same when it comes to having a religious community versus a social community? Mm. Another very good question, uh, which I'll get at briefly. I think in the second part. Certainly, we are social creatures in need of community, and our times with our family members and our friends are important. But what, Dave, what Dan Butner talks about, and we'll mention that here when we get to his Blue Zone book, is that it's important to be part, again, of a, of a religious, spiritual community, because there's something, and there's other research that support what he did with the Blue Zones. There's so much research that supports that being part of a religious community in which one um, has a sense of hope and purpose and meaning is just crucial and vital to one's well-being. And I'm not sure you can really find that in, in family and friends kinds of kinship. There's just something about a religious community that generates that kind of purposeful, hopeful, meaningful life. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Ranzlin. Why don't we get to the second half of your presentation? Okay, let's do that. So let me... Uh, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Okay, yeah, now I need to... Uh, let's see here. All right. Is that coming through on, on the appropriate... Is that okay? Yes, early Christian community sharing. Okay. So the first picture that we had of the early Christian community was it how profoundly united they were. The second picture underscores that it was a sharing community. And we have, this is quite challenging here, and we'll have to talk about this because it's just unbelievable, this radical generosity, this ethic of sharing that comes through in this portrait. So here's the passage. 
Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Notice again how united they were. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. God's grace was visibly, palpably manifest within them. And notice their commitment here. They were committed to make sure that there was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses, they sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. And they laid it at the apostles' feet. And these funds were distributed to each person as any had need. Wow, what a radical picture of generosity here that we'll need to uh, unpack. So first thing that we need to note is that this profound unity of the early church generated an unbelievable, incredible, radical generosity. They showed their genuine love for God and for one another by visibly expressing this in their sharing of material possessions. Now, let's say more about this. Now, although the selling and the sharing were voluntary, and I want to really underscore that, uh, there's something about this spirit-filled community that generated this radical generosity. But the sense that we get in reading through these two stories is that it's descriptive. It's describing the voluntary, uncoercive generosity of certain members of the church. We should not seek to, I think, replicate this in detail, um, nor should we view this as prescriptive. Uh, we should draw the principle that if you are part of the early Christian, if you're part of a Christian community, you need to have a sense of, of, of sharing, this ethic of sharing with others. So every Christian needs to make this conscientious decision before God in this manner. I think without question, we are called to generosity, especially towards the poor and the needy. And we should seek to imitate the care of the needy and the sacrificial generosity which the Holy Spirit created. Now, what you have here in, in the book of Acts, in both Acts 2 and Acts chapter 4, is the extension of the ministry of Jesus, um, in which a new people is being created that has a distinctive form. It's united and it is sharing. And it's profoundly concerned with the marginalized, the disenfranchised, the social outcasts. To use the language of the prophets, they're concerned with the orphan, the widow, and the resident alien. And this just is straight out of the mission of Jesus that you have in, for instance, Luke chapter four, where Jesus went to the synagogue on a Sabbath day, took the scroll of Isaiah and read out of Isaiah, I believe chapter 61, one and two, and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind to set the, at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, favor. And so right from the very beginning of the mission of Jesus, there's this concern with the social outcasts and the poor. And so the early Christian community is living out that mission in a very concrete way by expressing this radical generosity and sharing their possessions with all who had need. So, again, in the early Christian community, we see God at work creating a new people who are not defined by the old categories of race, of language, of gender, or social class. Now, that's quite a bit right there, right? These categories that oftentimes bring barriers and divide us, race, language, gender, or social class, they are being eliminated, eradicated, and they're being united in their witness to the resurrection and to a new way of life that embodies unity and the sharing of goods. And when that happened, God's grace was palpably and powerfully manifest and they sought to make sure that no one within the community was in need. The basic necessities of everyone was taken care of. So let's draw things to a close here. And I wanna do this by alluding to what I said earlier about this incredible book by Dan Buettner. 
And so again, let's think about uh, to recapit recapitulate some things here. We opened with the impact of the pandemic, of our digital world, and our rugged individualism. And we could add other uh, features that tend to occasion profound loneliness and social isolation. And I've suggested to you that a remedy to this loneliness and social isolation is to participate in kinship and in community, especially a religious community. And Dan Butner would agree with me on this. This is a famous book that came out, I think, in 2008, in which he did some research on the world's best practices in health and longevity and medicine. And he found that there are five places in all of the world where these practices are alive and well of health, longevity, and medicine. And here they are. There's one in Italy, in Japan, in Greece, and Costa Rica. But lo and behold, there's one in the United States. And guess what? It's right here in Loma Linda. It's just incredible. So Dan's uh, research led him to articulate these nine lessons for living longer. Here they are. But I want you to know lessons seven, eight, and nine, because they essentially get at kinship and community, especially lesson seven, where he encourages all of us to participate in a spiritual community. He says that the simple act of worship is one of those powerful habits that seems to improve your chances of having more good years. It really doesn't matter, as I said earlier, doesn't matter if you're a Muslim, a Christian, a Jewish person, a Buddhist, or a Hindu. Simply going to a religious community on a regular basis and engage in worship, that just brings about wholeness and well-being purpose and meaning. Why? He argues that belonging to a religious community tends to foster larger and denser social networks. I think that's a crucial phrase of his because we oftentimes think that perhaps family and friends is enough. He argues that no, uh, we need uh, to be part of a religious community because that extends our social networks even greater. People who attend services have higher self-esteem, self-worth, because religion encourages positive expectations. I would argue it encourages, as I said previously, a sense of hope, especially a sense of a hopeful future, that there is meaning and purpose to this life of ours. And that almost always tends to improve health. So may each of us embrace kinship, and community. Remembering that, to go back to my title, no man is an island, as John Dunn said. <clears throat> we are all social creatures, interdependent, interconnected with one another, in need of kinship and community. Thank you so much, Dr. Ranzelin. Powerful, powerful message. We do have some questions that we can close with here as we have time. Here's a question. Basically, this person may not be ready for church. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they said, are social clubs, workout groups, or outdoor organizations also, also useful? Absolutely. And there's no question that uh, to be home all by yourself all day is simply not a good thing. We are social creatures in, in desperate need of, of community. And so yes, um, book clubs, um, social clubs, um, other kinds of uh, networks with family and friends, all valuable and will increase your well-being. But having said that, I do want to underscore the point, and research bears this out. They have found that being part of a religious community perhaps is the best kind of kinship and community that one can be a part of for truly for one to truly experience wholeness, well-being, purpose, and meaning. The evidence is there. Mm -hmm. Well, our next question actually is about uh, our kids. So mm. can children start building community at a younger age? Yeah, I, I think it's just so important to already, you know, to take your kids to Sunday school, to Sabbath school, to religious communities so that they begin to participate and be involved in, in the life of the church so that they get socialized in, into that wonderful world. 
and we're we're great at that as as Adventists, not just with our churches, but also with our educational system, right? From beginning kindergarten all the way through university level, uh, we have this educational system that builds kinship, community, and fellowship that we take with us uh, for the rest of our days. You know, I have friends that to this very day I fellowship with and hang out with from my high school days as well as college days. Right. If you're actually looking, this is maybe a small tip. If this, if you're watching this during the summertime, yeah. um, a lot of Adventist churches have what they call vacation Bible school. Right. And they, and that is a fantastic introduction it's, to kids into church. Um, yeah. And they have wonderful activities and uh, resources there um, for vacation Bible school. Wonderful commercial, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So here is our last question, Dr. Ranzlin. Where can I find information about support systems within Loma Linda University Health? Wow, that's an excellent question. Perhaps I could turn that to you, the, the director of the Institute for Wholeness. You might be able to help me with that. What would you suggest? So I think there are several ways. And I think Dr. Ranzelin really mentioned um, service. Service yeah. was a part of community. So we have a wonderful volunteer department here at Loma Linda University Health that you can reach out to. We also have a chaplain service that has right. wonderful um, uh, groups um, it, and it, it could be groups if you're mourning. Um, there are many support groups that you could be involved with there. And then we also have two churches right on our campus right. um, so that you could definitely get involved with there. But right around the Loma Linda community, you can. I think, you know, if you are quarantining and you are trying to be very safe, there are a lot of also um, options when it comes to church. Um, to actually see it through um, the internet and online. And then if you can find a church that you're interested, you can, you know, check it out, you know, live as well. So there's many, many options. Yeah. But if you'd like to do service, that is one. And then we also have the Drayson Center. The Drayson Center right. is actually our, our gymnasium that we have here. And there are many groups that um, meet there. You can join a class. You can join a club um, over there. So we do have many, many options. But um, whatever fits your liking, I think yes. we have probably an option here at Loma Linda. Great answer. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Ranzlin, for your time here. I think this is a, a charge to all of us yeah. to um, widen our community and really foster it because it's not only good for us, but also good for the community as well. Exactly. And I want to thank each of you for joining us here for our discussion today. And I want to invite you to next month's um, presentation as well. And next month's presentation, we're having a little bit of a, a switch. We are going to be talking about dental health. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you have any ideas or questions about dental health, that would be a great presentation for you to watch live. We have Dr. Sherry with Shelley Withers that is going to be speaking to us from our very own School of Dentistry. Well, again, I'd like to thank each of you for joining us. My name is Dr. Olivia Moses, and we look forward